On today's podcast, my co-host Andrew and I, we sit down with Dr. Mark Monty. Dr. Monty is the longtime pastor of Faith Baptist Church in Danville, Indiana. Faith Baptist is a large, thriving, and very healthy church family. Pastor Monty and his wife Kelly, they have two biological sons, three foster sons, and literally hundreds of other people to whom they've ministered over the years. I am proud to be one of their three foster sons. When I was a 15-year-old teenager, Mark and Kelly brought this inner city kid into their home. Together, they made many sacrifices on my behalf, and they invested in me in numerous ways. Not only did I learn the Bible from them, but I actually got to see biblical principles lived out in their home. I feel a debt to Mark and Kelly Monty that I can never repay. If you know Pastor Monty, you know that he's lots of fun. So in today's podcast, we're going to walk through a variety of topics from which we will all benefit, I promise. This is part one, and next Friday, September 27th, we release part two. So we do two interviews with Pastor Monty. Uh, whether you're consuming this content on, on YouTube, Spotify, or Apple Podcasts, if you would, please consider sharing it for God's glory. So without any further ado, here comes some strength for your life. Welcome to the Strength for Life podcast with Pastor James C. Johnson, a ministry of North Stone Baptist Church in Pensacola, Florida. Pastor Monty, thank you so much for joining us on today's Strength for Life podcast. Well, thank you for having me. We are honored to have you. Now, you we have in this room, I am surrounded by Trump memorabilia, the MAGA <laughs> hat, and the, uh, the figurine here. I just mentioned that my son Matthew gave that to me out of the kindness of his heart. Now, I have reservations Did you notice about the President figurine? Trump from time to time. Did you notice what he added to the figurine? Take yeah. the figurine yes. down and look. Yes, I know. He put, turn, yes, he put... He added the, the band-aid the on the ear. patch. I don't know if I that did. could be it's seen. The You've got to make it more realistic. It's very realistic. Realistic, okay. yes. Yes, now I feel like when it comes to politics as Christians, we he's shaking his head all kinds of ways. <laughs> we need we, we need to call balls and strikes, you know. You though are a much more enthusiastic Trump supporter. Don't get me wrong, I will vote for President Trump compared to Kamala Harris. But talk to us about your love and affection for President Trump. It does seem to be pretty unreserved. Am I right to say that? Well, it is right to say that. And back way back, even before the 2016 election, when Trump announced his candidacy, descending on that uh, escalator in that building, and all of us remember that iconic moment. Yes, very inspirational Melania. moment. He came uh, to say. The, day. the moment he did that, I thought in my mind, because all I knew of Donald Trump was real estate developer and the TV show guy, the you're fired TV show guy. And, yeah. and I thought, well, this is just a stunt. But in my heart, I thought, you know, probably a smart stunt. He likes publicity. And so sure. I just kind of went, went away thinking that it was nothing. But then after the very first debate with that very crowded field of Republican uh, hopefuls for the nomination... And after listening to Donald Trump, I remember texting a group of pastors. You were on that text. Yes, and, I remember. And, uh, and I said something along this lines, like it or not, Donald Trump is our next president. Mm -hmm. And the reason I felt confident in that was he had the ability to speak to the rage of the American people, mm -hmm. what, they, what they were going through. And, and he spoke to my feelings, and he, he expressed those feelings. Now, we all know that Donald Trump is not a saint. We are not electing a pastor. We're electing a president. But uh, the position that he takes with the Republican platform is the closest to the biblical position. In, in addition... Compared, compared to Compared Kamala. to the, the Democratic platform and, and, no doubt and about Kamala. It. Remember Kamala. Cackling yes. Kamala. Yes. <laughs> Remember when there were 16 Republican candidates, among them were some men with morals. I mean, Ted Cruz and others. Yes, ben there were, Carson, there were ben good Carson. men. There were In good that men. moment, would you have selected some of those other men over President Trump? Well, before I heard that... Before I heard the debate i would have but yes. immediately after the debate i understood something it's it's uh, it's got a lot to do with policy it also has to do with personality but it it also has to do with the ability to communicate mm -hmm. and um 
I loved Ted Cruz's policy, but his communication ability, he always sounds like he's talking down to you mm. and like he's lecturing you or chiding an idiot child. Mm. And that is not going to win the vote of the American people. So yeah. I, I have to admit there's a part of me that likes the theatrics of Trump mm -hmm. that likes He's very entertaining the, and the, he's hilarious. I do like that. And he's funny. Now, when people try to parse the words of Donald Trump, that's in vain. He mm -hmm. is not a detail person in his speech. He is a big picture person. Mm -hmm. And and so don't parse his words. Just try to catch the big feeling that he's trying <laughs> to it. convey and, yeah. and enjoy the feeling. But understand this, that behind that is a very, very active mind, a very mm -hmm. successful man, a man with an incredible memory. Mm -hmm. And so when you listen to Donald Trump, kind of you're, it's kind of like you're along for the ride a little bit. That's and if you're going to be on a ride, you might as well enjoy the ride. It's called and, the Trump train. And, and the, for, yes, a reason, the train. for a reason. And yes. his, his, uh, his sense of humor, yeah. Kelly and I will sit at home uh, when he was running and then when he was president and he'd be on TV and, you know, he always made us laugh, mm -hmm. no matter how bad things oh, yes. were. Trump would say yes. something that would make us laugh, Britain and we appreciated. Too, yeah. We appreciated that. Well, whether he intended to or not, it was just funny. Right. And, he, and the <laughs> the other thing you have to know about Trump, if it's crossing through his mind, yeah. it's coming out of his mouth. Yeah, yeah. And you never had to worry. I wonder what he's really thinking, mm -hmm. because there it was, like it or lump it, there it was. And I appreciate that about Trump. Pastor Money, I, I see a lot of personality similarities between you and former President Trump. Thank you. Yeah. I appreciate that. That's a very high compliment. Yes, yes, sir, in a lot of regards. Um, so uh, I think that there's a lot of Christians out there that uh, are, are a little bit, uh, you know, scared or they don't know what to do in regards to November, this upcoming election, because they feel that Trump's morals are uh, kind of disqualify him from their vote. Uh, but but they kind of feel this this odd dilemma where they have to pick between two evils. So what would you say to, specifically to Christians that are going through that right now? Well, that that's real simple. That kind of dilemma is something that people who think in a small box would would have. The same Christian who is worried, oh, I don't know, should I vote for Donald Trump? Okay, if you're if you're worried about that, you had better never again read the 23rd Psalm. Because the 23rd Psalm was written by a man who was not only an adulterer, but a murderer. And understand that the Psalms of David, David was not pristine in his moral character. We would all agree he could have done better. Donald Trump could have done better as well. All of us, frankly, could do better. Mm -hmm. Now, we don't sweep the transgressions of Trump under the rug. That's between him and God. But we also don't dismiss him as a man of great leadership ability and a man that we can vote for. Again, if, if you're if you're going to, well, I have I have and that type of thing, Andrew, is so goofy. A lot it's of moral high horse among among some Christian that's watching murder and adultery on TV at night, but then they're gonna be pious and not vote for him in November. They better stop reading the Psalms. They better cut out anything mm -hmm. that had to do with King David in the Bible who is a type of Christ, by the way. They better just cut it all out of their Bible because they're far too holy for any of that. I think the Christians that Andrew are uh, referring to uh, would abstain from voting altogether. Uh, you know, that's they won't vote for Kamala because they know she's a mess, and then President Trump. By the way, I would love it if President Trump would pray Psalm 51 over his transgressions like David did. But anyhow, uh, tell us what, t speak to the person that, speak to the person that's not going to vote at all in this election. What well, would you say to that, the okay. Christian person? So voting, there's, there's two ways to view this, okay? Um, whether or not you vote, voting is your right mm -hmm. okay and i personally view my right to vote as a stewardship so god has given me a stewardship in the money he's given me the influence he's given me the mm -hmm. people he's put into my life all of those things are stewardship my american citizenship is a stewardship mm -hmm. okay so i need to determine how as a, a christian i can best steward my vote now it is possible that the Republican platform will change down the line somewhere and, and uh, maybe um, endorse abortion. Okay, if that happens, then I would be loath to vote for the Republican candidate. I do not want to vote for a pro-abortion candidate. That would be very problematic to me. But because the platform at this point is 
uh, not perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but kind of within the pale, I feel like I can still vote for the platform and for President Trump in particular. Now, it is a stewardship. So I steward my vote. I don't want to waste my vote by not voting and investing my stewardship. However, however, we are Baptist people. And we believe in something called individual soul liberty. Mm -hmm. And that is the right of every Christian to worship God according to the dictates of his conscience. We believe in the believer priesthood. And so any Christian who has a conscience to not vote for whatever reason that may be, mm -hmm. then he should not violate his conscience. And I should respect that mm -hmm. as a matter of choice for his conscience. But just as I respect his choice not to vote... Right. He should not judge me for voting for Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. This is a matter of preference. It's a matter of co uh, conscience. This is a Romans 14 issue. But mm -hmm. for me personally, I view my American citizenship as a stewardship, mm -hmm. and I want to steward my vote to the best of my ability. That's a great answer. I really like that. Uh, here's another question. Uh, would you ever vote for a female president? Maybe let's say the female president is, you know, has the morals uh, a of conservative. The, yeah, yeah, remember Carly Fiorina was a, a strong conservative outspoken. Mm -hmm. She used to mm -hmm. be the vice president of Hewlett Packard and then yeah. was on the Republican uh, in the Republican Party. Yeah. Would you have ever vote for a Carly Fiorina over maybe a Joe Biden or somebody? I would vote. I would vote for a female president. But let me tell you this. She better not have one dirty dish in that sink. <laughs> <laughs> That is wild. Oh. Yeah, no, biblically speaking, uh, that, biblically speaking, I, the laundry joking. has to be folded. I'm joking. Yeah. I'm joking. No, if, uh, if she's a married uh, woman, then <laughs> biblically speaking, she's to be submissive to her husband. And if she's so, the her husband becomes isn't... the de facto president. Yes, I mean biblically. So there are, are, there, are there biblical that's a great justification? Point. That's a good point. Biblical justification for voting for a female president in the United States. Okay, so so I am not in any degree misogynistic but i i feel <laughs> like that joke and i feel yeah. like <laughs> i feel like some women i feel like some women are far far more capable so if you had sure, a though. resurrected margaret thatcher yeah. okay she was a very capable leader of england and so a prime minister so mm -hmm. I, I think there are some very capable women there um it would really, honestly, it would really depend on the person. Mm -hmm. uh, it go, it all goes back to the person at this point. I would never cast a vote for cackling Kamala. No, me neither. Never. Now, you mentioned some, you, you talked about abortion just a minute ago and the, the Republican platform in relationship to abortion, specifically President Trump. Now, I am voting for President Trump, but not because of his position on abortion. I, uh, because as far as I understand, he's okay with aborting a baby up to 15 weeks. Now, Ron DeSantis, wa you know, wanted to kind of limit it in the state of Florida, to, in the state of Florida within six weeks. Uh, so I'm completely against abortion uh, in the abolitionist kind of sense. I know you are as well. Yes. Yes. But, um, but it, it frustrates me that President Trump, I feel like, has kind of waffled on this abortion issue. And, and it seems a little bit like a cop out to say, turn it over to the states and, you know, and let everybody else decide. I wish we had a strong you know, president in there, anti-abortion president. And I feel like Ron DeSantis was much closer to that, Ted Cruz, some of those guys. But the reasons I'm voting for President Trump is because I do believe he's going to make America sa safe again, make America mm -hmm. safe again. He's going to make America rich again. Mm -hmm. You know, he's going to take better care of us. It's just going to be a better place. Um, so those are reasons why. And then I'm voting for him because the only other alternative is cackling and, and that, that is a lot of people's thinking you know you go back to the abortion issue a roe v wade we've been stuck with that or we're stuck with that for many many decades it became uh part of our dna as american uh citizens now trump yeah. was responsible for nominating judges that helped right, overturn right. that and, that's and awesome. move the decision yeah. back to the hands of the state i i don't view that as a cop-out but I view it as only part of the work has been done. Yeah. And then you have the issues among the states and how that's going to turn out in red states and blue states. But when, 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 you know, when you look at the sum total net, you're going to have babies' lives saved as a result of Trump's Supreme Court nominees. It, it was a step in the right direction. Mm -hmm. It is not it is, complete. Yeah. And I'm not expecting Donald Trump to complete that. Yeah. In, in regard to um, Trump taking care of me, I'm not looking 
for Donald Trump or Kamala Harris or anyone to take care of me. What, what I want in my heart is um, a president that will unleash the power of the capitalist system so that I can take care of yeah. myself. That's how he'll make America rich And that again. is how yeah, America yeah. will be rich again, not by the socialist policies right. of Kamala Harris. Price fixing. She, she's already talking about price fixing. And a lot of dumb people, and I hate to say this, but a lot of dumb people are going to go, oh, well, Kamala is going to make sure that my hostess ho-hos only cost a dollar. <laughs> Number one, no, she's not. That will never happen, yeah, okay? Yeah. Um, and number two, if she did, the hostess company would stop making your ho-hos. Right. The ho-hos you're to happy <laughs> to pay five bucks for, right. you know, you're because you're going to buy those ho-hos. If they're $10, you're buying the ho-hos, okay? You're going to buy those things. You'd like to see them at a dollar, but if the price is forced at a dollar, they're going to stop making them yeah. altogether. Yeah. They'll stop. And that, that for some, not for me personally, but for some, that would be the greatest tragedy. Sure. That's a good answer. Uh, I, yeah. So I feel like um, there are some Christians out there, kind of switching gears to talk about the church a little bit, but still a politic question. Uh, there are some Christians out there that are uh, upset that there's a lot of pastors uh, preaching politics, like as they would say, from the pulpit. And so both of you could probably give an answer to this, because I know you've preached on it a lot, and you went through series as talking about woke stuff and, and abortion and other things. So, Pastor Monty, we'll start with you, and then you could give a give an answer there, too. Why, well, why should pastors preach on some of these political things? A, a great sigh that the evangelical and even fundamentalist world is silent on one of the most critical issues of our day when the Bible addresses this. But you, you go back to Scripture. Did biblical characters address political issues? All of the prophets, every one of them, address the political issues of their time. Mm -hmm. John the Baptist addressed the political issues of his time, the immorality in leadership, the, 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 the mm -hmm. um, leadership in or the king of, of Israel at the time, the puppet king, you know, yes, yes. Uh, all of these different things. So you have that. You have, you, you don't focus your pulpit time on that. But there is application from the Bible that can be made. And here is a, a great problem in American churches is the Bible is by itself relatable, but a pastor needs to demonstrate its relatability. My Christianity is not confined to the church pew. My Christianity goes with me into the voting booth. Right. Part of my responsibility to is to inform the congregation biblically, and politics is part of our lives. You know, it's so interesting to me, guys, what's so interesting. Um, a pastor can stand up who's a sports fan, and he can use sports illustrations. He can talk about sports. He can talk about his team won, his team lost. He could incorporate that into sermons in an illustra illustrative matter. Everybody's fine with that. But the moment you mention something that's sure. really impactful, mm -hmm. politics, People just shy away from it like you've done something wrong. That is not historically accurate. It's not biblically accurate. And I think that the pulpit must be able to give people a sense of the time and a sense of reasonable biblical thinking about that area. Now, again, that doesn't take center stage. The cross of Christ and, and the mm -hmm. gospel mm -hmm. is center stage. But these are things we should talk about. Yeah, amen. Yeah, and it's, it is all part of shepherding people. And we, Christ is the chief shepherd. We are the under shepherds. Um, yeah, I did about a 10 week series th that people would view as political. Uh, really though, politics, you know, used to be um, like uh, fiscal responsibility. You know, go back 50 years ago, it used to be more about fiscal responsibility and foreign policy. And politics in America has moved into the moral realm. We're talking about same sex marriage and aborting babies and, uh, and transgenderism. And so it's like, because we are preachers of righteousness, we have to deal with morals. It's not our fault that politics moved into our arena. And so I don't make apology for preaching that 10 week sermon series. Uh, however, uh, there were a few commenters and, and people. Uh, we, we actually had a couple walk out of one of the services. I dealt with the mm. border crisis from Deuteronomy 22, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and they just didn't like politics in the pulpit. Um, and, and then we've had emails, and then we even had one commenter talking about, you know, keep preaching like that and you'll lose your 501c3. So do you ever, <laughs> do you ever, you know, they say you can't endorse a candidate in the pulpit. Now, I haven't done that. I've just preached biblical principles that pertain to what people are calling political issues. You 
you do uh, like unapologetically mention your love for Donald Trump in your pulpit. And you, I have a worry? right. I have a legal right. Let's clarify this. What if they take your 501c3? They can't for that. Okay, okay tell okay, us we, about We that. need to clarify this. So what am I allowed to say? I am allowed to, as an American citizen, say anything I want in my pulpit as a citizen. Faith Baptist Church cannot endorse a candidate for president. I see. We cannot support. We cannot have uh, political rallies or in support. And by the way, many churches do this. Many mm -hmm. churches do this. You'll right. see this in the Democratic oh, yeah. side all the time. But we, we stay away from that. But I can say, speaking for myself, mm -hmm. that I will vote for President Trump. Mm -hmm. I am not endorsing him as in, quote, a church endorsement, but I am allowed to give my personal opinion. Yeah. Absolutely. Good answer. Talk to us about Israel a little bit. Uh, now, how many times have you been to Israel? Three or four times, I think? Three times. Yeah, and I was there once with you. Mm -hmm. um, so if you were Benjamin Netanyahu, how would you solve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict? The only true solution is the return of Christ. Mm -hmm. That is the only true solution. Right. But yeah. I know you didn't want that answer. So <laughs> so we're going to give you a... Well, no, that's biblical. Uh, well, no, it's biblical, but we, we have to give you a, an answer. Pragmatic answer. A pragmatic answer, yeah. okay? Um, having been there three times, and one of them was a geopolitical tour, having been there three times, uh, if you've never been there and don't really understand the conflict, you really don't have a good perspective. When you understand that all of the people, the, the uh, ancestors of the people who live in the Gaza Strip and the West Bank, that all of those people, their ancestors, were offered full Israeli citizenship in 1948. They were offered full Israeli citizenship uh, and they were told by their leadership to reject citizenship in the new nation of Israel. And so then you cannot have a country without citizens and borders, although some people try today, but you can't have that. Yeah, and so they went nonsense. to refugees, ca refugee camps at the behest of their leadership. Okay. Uh, so uh, uh, it has been a sad situation where they, Palestinian people, and I think this was uh, Golda Meir, Golda Meir, early prime minister, made the statement. She said, the Palestinian people never miss an opportunity to miss an opportunity. <laughs> and their opportunity, yeah. by the way, many Arabs, uh, peoples accepted full citizenship. They are represented in the Knesset, okay? Mm -hmm. Those who did not became uh, refugees, and then they hold on strongly to their victim card. The conflict between Israeli and Arab uh, and and the the descendants of, of on Ishmael. Those, yeah Ishmael yeah. and all yeah. that that goes back to Bible times okay course, that yeah. will not ever change mm -hmm. okay they they uh, Ishmael's a wild man leave yeah. him alone okay so his coming, hand is against every man and every man's hand against him yeah okay. coming off of October seventh yes okay. And Hamas is attack. You understand? You know the Hebrew better than I do. You know the word Hamas is the word violence. Mm -hmm. We're not surprised if you call yourself Hamas that you, you uh, skewered babies and baked them. And I mean, they did that to Israeli babies. So October seventh, what's your response if you're Benjamin Netanyahu? I think he's done the right thing. To be frank with you, I only wish. Uh, so Israel, Israel is the only civilized country in the Middle East. Let me repeat that again. Mm -hmm. Israel is the only civilized country in the Middle East. Israel is the only friend that America has in the entire Middle East. Mm -hmm. you, 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 both you need to understand that. Um, what he did was enter in a military and completely justifiable military action to overthrow Hamas. So people look at October 7th. They do not understand that these people lob missiles at Israeli settlements and villages constantly. Yes, constantly. Yes. When I when was we in the, visiting, that a border, was a concern. yes, a, well, yeah. that was a concern. Yeah. I went to a border, a village, a, a kibbutz that's on right on the border near Gaza City, and and uh, the playground. It had all this playground equipment, like um, a concrete equipment that kids could go in and out of, like, and it was designed to look like animals. Like one was like a worm, and you know, real festive colored. And the tour guide explained all that that concrete equipment that the children play on. They said that those are bomb shelters. And the children are trained that mm -hmm. the moment the siren sounds, if they're in that park, they go into their equipment mm -hmm. to survive the savages that are lobbing missiles across the border. Mm -hmm. Now, Netanyahu had to act very quickly 
there's Israel has in the world's eyes a very small window of opportunity of acceptable response. Mm -hmm. But Israel is never now no this is not true of any other nation in the world. But Israel is never allowed in the eyes of the world to have a huge response immediately. And so they always have to measure their response. So they sent one missile, we'll send one missile. They did this, we'll do this. At this point, the transgression of October 7th was large enough to justify easily a military invasion of Gaza. But I knew when that happened that they had to move quickly, and I wish they had the capability to move much more quickly and more dramatically. Now, Israel is a humanitarian country, so they are concerned about uh, the lives of civilians. Hamas hides behind the civilians. Even so they're, Palestinian yeah. civilians are oh, concerned yes, about the lives of Palestinians. Yes, they're very concerned about yes. the lives of Palestinians. Listen, the, the hospital care is in Israel. So when Palestinian children are sick or have a serious need, they cross over into Israel. Palestinians point. come to work in Israel to make money because there's no jobs in, in Gaza. Why are there no jobs in Gaza? Because Hamas runs the show. Mm -hmm. It is a very sad situation for those people. Yeah, so, but I, now they had to root this out. Mm -hmm. And and uh, so I, I applaud what he did. Now, Good. I hope he can do more, mm -hmm. and I hope he can do it more quickly, but they have to root it out once and for all. So, Pastor Money, I think it's pretty clear who who's evil here, okay? I think, clear. I think it's pretty clear. So why is it that so many people my age, you know, on, the, on college campuses and... Especially the Ivy League college yes, campuses. Yes, yes, yes. And all these people are pro-Palestine and they're, you know, assaulting pro-Israel people. And it's, it's like absolutely backwards of like this, the, this party is evil. Yeah. And, and the majority of people are supporting that party. It, it, it feels like of Isaiah 520, where they call good evil and evil good. Well, I, I think, we I think there's certainly an element of a satanic delusion, mm -hmm. but I also think that American youth are looking for a cause. And frankly, they've been tempered with the use of social media, with the use of, 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 of algorithms that move them into hyper rage as they read. They've been tempered to express rage more than, and, and I know we had the 60s and we've had riots before, but they're, they're right on the verge of blowing up about something and they've simply adopted something of rage. And frankly, they've adopted a completely false narrative yeah. because uh, Israel is very charitable. The, 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 the people of Gaza, they don't like the Israelis, okay? They, they, the, I'm not talking about Hamas, I'm talking about the rank and file. Mm -hmm. But Israel provides them with their water. Israel provides them with their electricity. They're supposed to pay the bill. They don't pay the bill. So then it gets cut off for a while. And then they all get mad at Israel for cutting it off. Um, the Palestinian people have been offered, I believe I'm correct to say on three separate occasions, uh, yeah. statehood, okay? Right, you're right. Yeah. And have rejected statehood on three separate occasions because if they agree to statehood, they have to give up one thing to have a state, a Palestinian state. They give up one thing. And that one thing that they will not give up is their victim card, mm -hmm. their victim card. Because yeah. the moment they become a, a state, yeah. the moment they become a state, now you are responsible for yourself. You stand on your own two feet and they do not want that. Generations of people who have been trained to be victims. Yeah. And it's True. horrible. Yeah. It's a horrible situation. And this is another reason why I will vote for President Trump. I feel like the Biden administration waffled on support uh, what is to be our ally Israel. And President Trump, of course, moved the embassy from Tel Aviv yes. to Jerusalem appropriately. Yes. And but by the way, uh, you mentioned the Supreme Court justices that were appointed under President Trump. I do think, for whatever people think of Mike Pence, I think that was Pence's influence on Trump. Very and I, possibly. And I also Very think, possibly. Uh, yeah, I also think Trump's love, President Trump's love for Israel, was Mike Pence's influence. What do you think of J.D. Vance? Oh, good question. Well, J.D. Vance. Okay, so um, years ago, before most people knew the name J.D. Vance, someone gave me a copy of the book Hillbilly Elegy. This is years ago. Right, he wrote that a long time ago. And, yeah. uh, and I read the book. I, I couldn't put it down. It, it fascinated me. It was well written. And then I was surprised to find that he was running as a senator and then a senator in Ohio. I was surprised to find that. Um, and he really does come from for lack of a better word, kind of a white trash background. Okay, sure. He really does. He knows the struggle 
of people that have have grown up in the rust belt and and have grown up in poverty and he is a shining example of someone who can work his way through adversity and take legitimate advantage of the american system and rise to the top and rise to success and because he was able to do that without government handouts and the assistance of of all kinds of people he's now the enemy because mm -hmm. he rose up himself right. and and i will tell you this guys just remember something in your lives uh, if you are a failure people will have sympathy on you and love you if you are a success all you will garner is critics mm -hmm. and you just ignore those critics and jd vance has had the ability to do that so i like him i like yeah, him a good, lot good so you're in Pensacola this week because you're teaching at Pensacola Theological Seminary. That's yes. wonderful. And yesterday you joined us at North Stone. You weren't preaching, but you were here just supporting us and worshiping the Lord with us. And you started the day off in Chaplain Lieb's class, Sunday school. Yes. Uh, Andrew was mm -hmm. in there with you. Fun. Tell us some of your takeaways having experienced a, a, just a typical Sunday at North Stone. Well, I was, I was impressed. Of course, I told you this privately, but uh, usually when I'm here, I'm here to speak and very infrequently on a Sunday morning. And so I don't think I've been in the gymnasium auditorium on a Sunday morning ever, ever, you know, since it moved okay. over here. Um, here, my impression was this, a thriving church, mm -hmm. a growing church, a, a church, by the way, of all age groups, okay? You have your older senior saints and you have your young families and you have your kids. You have people, I, I love the, the variety, let's go ahead and use the word, the diversity mm -hmm. within the church, meaning that uh, you have people that um, are, are clearly fundamental Baptist people, but then you have people who don't even, they look like they don't know what end is up, but here they are. Right, okay? amen, yeah. And everything in between. People and, we get and to disciple. Yeah. You're discipling and people are growing and people are being saved. I, I loved it. Mm -hmm. I, my, my impression was a church of life and vitality, a church where the word of God is exalted and where Christ amen. is first, and really, really mirroring what my view would be of a New Testament church. Amen, amen. Loved it. Well, it is, it's fun to have you here because I do talk a lot about you in the pulpit. Uh, you know, of course, the, the primary person I'm speaking of in the pulpit is the Lord Jesus. And, a, and then a second <laughs> good, is, good. is good. my wife, Britton. Let's good. turn the tables here. <laughs> and then is you, is Let's, you. You should talk about him. Tell us a little bit about how he was as a young person. He does all the talking about you. Now it's your turn to talk about This him. won't be yeah. edited out. It definitely well chris is here i'm a little he's nervous gonna, now he's yeah. not gonna edit no anything else. no You're talking about um, young james yeah james as a young person Tell us i some was stories, a youth preacher. pastor in uh, in minneapolis how long have we known and each other what would you say what what year was it when you came to minneapolis i don't even remember uh, early 90s right yeah i think so somewhere yeah. in there yeah. and um and I moved into your house in 94. Uh, right your he, mom he, kind of dropped you off right at our house one day yeah. um uh yeah. So James was a very difficult student, Andrew, I, I will tell you. We had a, a small uh, church basement Christian school, and I taught uh, junior high and senior high every subject. <laughs> And uh, that is really ridiculous, but <laughs> not, uh, it, it is not the it is not the model of Christian education I would recommend. But um, we had a, a church van. We did not charge. Our school was tuition free, so we didn't charge. And I would go around and and pick up kids from the bus route whose parents had allowed them to come to our Christian school. And uh, James was one of those kids. And I, I got to know him early on. We didn't get along. Right. He and I did not get along at all. I was his teacher. I was his authority figure. He could never sit still in school. He would he wouldn't try. He would be absent a lot. He would always ask if he could leave the classroom and 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 go to what was a Dairy Queen or something down the road. I mean, there was and he would offer to buy me stuff, so I let him do it, of course. But uh, <laughs> but um, right. but uh, it, it was very difficult. And I, I remember one day. I don't remember what why. But we had, uh, we, he and I had a, a real conflict. You couldn't have been maybe 14, yeah, maybe 14. Right. And in the classroom, there was a real conflict. And, and I was furious because you were disruptive and, and just difficult to manage and wouldn't listen and, and wild and out of control. And, and I was bringing you home that day. And I decided to drop off all the other kids first so that I could yell at you and let you have it in the van. And I remember pulling over. I remember where this was. Mm -hmm. I remember pulling over uh, on the side of the street and I was furious. And I put that old church van up in park and I looked at him and I said, what 
is wrong with you? Uh, and I yelled it. Uh, really, I was just, it was, I was very angry. And um, uh, he, you looked defiant at me. You looked very defiant. And then your lips started to quiver and then he started to tear up. And then you told me about your home life and you told me about, uh, you know, the situation, the abuse and, and all of these things. And it, it was in that moment that the Lord spoke to my heart and said, okay, you're his dad going forward. Hmm. And then my heart toward your dad changed and his heart toward me changed. Mm -hmm. And uh, later on, when his mom moved away, she gave him to us and he came to live in our home. Yeah. And that's kind of how it all happened. Yeah. Now he was out of control. <laughs> Don't misunderstand. And, and even after that, even after that just, relationship began, okay, he did the crazy out of control things. I just things. wanted to do um, hood rat stuff with my friends. Again, well, you were doing hood rat stuff. Could, yeah. I'll talk about that car. Well, I don't okay. know. You don't need to talk about whatever. I think I should talk <laughs> about that car. So, so, um, so we were in church one, um, well, it was a weekday. I was riding with him somewhere in, in church van or something, and he started quizzing me about auto insurance. He's like 14, and he's like, now, uh, preacher, tell me about auto insurance. How does that work, and where do you buy that? And what all these questions about auto insurance. And I thought, well, where is this coming from? I, out of the clear blue, and I did my best to answer, and he seemed satisfied with the answers, and so I kind of forgot about it until Sunday night. And Sunday night, there was a sermon, and I remember during the invitation, him and another boy came forward, and they knelt at the altar. And the moment I saw that, I said, okay, something has happened. And right after church, they just disappeared. They were, they were gone. That was not unusual. The kids would just, it was a city church, and the kids would scatter and go do things. And, and uh, so later on that night, he came home, and everything seemed fine. It was much, much later that um, he, I asked him something about that auto insurance question. Much months later, probably months. I don't know. I don't know. Much later. You remember aspects um, of the story differently than I do because I was a kid. Right. You're an, an adult observing adult. it. Yeah. Okay. And so at some point, um, he, I asked him about that, and he said, "Well, he said I needed to know for the car that I had." And I said, "What car did you have?" And he said, well, I didn't want to be driving this car illegally. He had gone to a used car. I didn't car, even have a license. A used car. He had no license. He's 14. Right. And he, he went to a, with a friend one night. They were at a used car lot, little one of those little lots, you know, uh -huh. and checking doors. And they found a door open, and they found keys in the car. And so they took the car the off battery was the dead. lot. The battery was dead in the car, but the keys were in it, and it was a stick shift. Okay, and so you I knew how to pop the clutch. Okay, I didn't know that yeah, aspect so, of the and story. It was on a little bit of a hill, okay. and my buddy pushed it, and it was in reverse. Mm -hmm. So he pushed it backwards, and we had just enough momentum to pop the clutch and get her started. And get her started, which and, is remarkable because <laughs> most teenagers 14, today, yeah, most teenagers crazy. today don't know how to do that. Right, okay, I'd rather yeah. have teens know how and to do that and steal it. cars than not know how to do that. Okay. <laughs> we probably okay. had it for two weeks or so, something. At least two weeks, and just zipped around That's Minneapolis. Crazy. And then I did get convicted. You had preached something. They, you parked it. You parked it a distance away from our <laughs> yes, house so yes, that I would never, never know never this it. car. But for a couple of weeks, they had yes. this car. What and, a story! And I, yeah, and I told my buddy, I was like, I'm, "This is wrong. We need to bring this car back." And <laughs> Although you <laughs> wanted to drive legally with insurance, I was trying. I was, I was trying to be reasonable. So we eventually did bring it back. Wow. And you filled it with gas. You told me we you did. filled it with yeah, gas so that it was all back. I can't even imagine the used car lot. I can't. Can't even imagine <laughs> that this car's gone for two weeks and now this car that is arrives. crazy what a story yeah. that's hood rat stuff what a story my friends yeah that's so anything that you do andrew yeah pales in comparison <laughs> right okay <laughs> that's a that's a great story that's money i want to say just thank you personally uh for the influence you've had on his life because you know i wouldn't be in church today i don't think without you know the impact that you've had on his life and so, you know, I appreciate that, Yeah. you know, indirectly, the influence on me, for sure. Thank you. And you have had and a direct influence that. on me thank as well. You. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and Pastor Monty, I want to thank you too, because I know we're getting mushy-gushy here a little bit. But, yeah, you inspired me when I was a kid. I mean, you spoke, you know, you're the human reason. The Lord's the divine reason I'm in mm -hmm. ministry, but you're the human reason. You spoke uh, this kind of into my head and heart, and I was like, and you made ministry look fun. 
And yes. so I was like, I, I want to serve God. It should be God. fun, to and, a degree. And you made it look uh, like it, you know, and it does have an eternal impact, and you modeled that. And you would write the notes to me in a journal you gave me, a couple journals along the way, and, and notes in books you gave me, that G. Campbell Morgan book, Genesis Which Revelation, you've never read. Which I've never read. <laughs> <laughs> I don't use in sermon preparation, but I read the note you wrote in the front. You know, and you talked about, James, you have talent and God can use you and stay close to him and love your Bible and all these things. And it's like, yeah. And here I am, a misfit kid, you know, doing hood rat stuff with my friends. And you're putting in my head and heart that God could use me in a significant way to impact eternity. And he has. He has. Amen. And it gave I was me really beaming. Life. I was beaming on on Sunday. Because I was taking pictures and that we and, saw, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, and that, know, that, like, that that impact on me had an impact on my family, right? You know, and on my son. Yeah, we wouldn't so. we wouldn't be in church. We'd have a nice stick shift car, but we probably, <laughs> we probably would not be in church. Yeah, right. And then Kelly's sacrifice too. I would be remiss if I didn't mention that. The, the fact that she would let a hood kid in her home. You know, when I was fifteen, I moved in with you, and fifteen, sixteen, and seventeen. You know, Kelly fed me and took care took care of me, tolerated me. While you guys were trying to raise your own two biological sons, you know, you were taking care of me and for a while, Jason and Benny. Um, you have you have two biological sons, three foster sons. One reason why, and then of course you have what you've called, I think, a black sheep ministry to mm -hmm. a lot of guys that, who've went wayward and then, you know, they come back. One reason why I think you're such an excellent father might have to do with the fact that your dad personally died when you were just in eighth grade. Would you talk to us about that a little bit? Maybe his impact on your on your life. Your dad's name's Thomas. Thomas. So so that goes back to before we were saved. We were a family that uh, moral, good family, but never went to church. Never had anything to do with church. My dad said one time when I was little, he said, "If anyone asks you what religion you are, you tell them Catholic and change the subject immediately." And so uh, that was our marching orders from dad. But. Um, when I, my dad got cancer in the 1970s, and uh, the, the treatments were different from how they are now, it was colon cancer, and by 1979, uh, we knew that he was going to pass. Most of his illness he spent in our home. They had a hospital bed and other furnishings in the home, but toward the end of that uh, time, they moved him into a hospital, and I remember... Uh, as a kid, my mother, we weren't, you, when, at that time, children couldn't go visiting in the hospitals, but there came a point where my mother said, hey, we're going to go visit dad. And she didn't have to say to me, this is the last time you're ever going to see him. I, I knew mm -hmm. that because it was special to go. And we went, it was really awkward. It was, uh, it was a very awkward visit, you know, um, all of us knowing this would be the last time we'd ever see him alive, but nobody saying that. And um, it was very impactful. And I remember as a, a boy, turning my back to walk out of the room and knowing that I'd never see my dad alive again. I remember that thought going through my head. Now, at this point in time, we're not a Christian family, um, and so dad passed away. But uh, before he died, he told my mother to enroll myself and my brother in a quote-unquote religious school. And the reason he did was he was a public school teacher, and he did not like the direction of the Minneapolis public schools. And so after his death, my mother thought she should honor that wish, and um, she went to talk to the Roman Catholic neighbor next door to figure out what school to enroll us in and all of that, because Minneapolis are a lot of Catholic schools, and mom just thought that would be the place to go. And that neighbor, very dedicated Catholic people, the neighbor told, his name was Mr. Tiffany, he told my mother, he said, uh, he said, don't enroll them in a Catholic school. He said, you need to enroll them at Fourth Baptist Christian School on the north side. We'd never heard of it, but mom called the Fourth Baptist School, and, and uh, long story short, we were enrolled, having known nothing about even what a Baptist was, uh, and they took us in. They knew we weren't saved, but Dr. Clearwaters practiced open enrollment. Hmm. Okay, he didn't. it wasn't one of those us for no more, and you have to be saved, sanctified, and good as Jesus if you're coming to our school. That, 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 that's not evangelistic, but it was open enrollment. If you kept the rules, you could be there. Mm -hmm. And I heard the gospel there and listened for several months and finally accepted Christ as my Savior Amen. through all of that experience. And uh, about eighth grade is when your dad passed, and about eighth grade is when you started going to Fourth Baptist, I think, just after that. Yeah, seventh right? grade dad passed, and then eighth grade, okay. fall of eighth and grade. And am year. I right to say 
that pretty much from eighth grade on, you were a straight A student. Like, like when you got saved, well, you started getting good grades. Okay. Okay. It, it had an impact on so academics. My dad was an educator yeah. in the public school system, and he uh, he was concerned about my academic failing mm. uh, because I was very, very poor academically. And uh, the Christian school is far more challenging, mm -hmm. and I knew that going in. Uh, once I got there, I realized how much more challenging it was. Um, but uh, they taught that you had to glorify God in your grades. This was a huge issue to them. And um, since I'm interested in God now and starting to learn things, I thought, well, my grades are more than just me. It's a reflection on God. And so, but after I got saved, I really took that very, very seriously and um, and poured mm -hmm. my mind into that. And I, I feel like the Lord helped me with that. Yeah. But a young person who was not ac academic became highly academic. Yeah. And you are a naturally erudite individual. Tell us about some of those teachers at Fourth Baptist, you oh. know, like Mrs. Underbach. Oh. And some of these. Oh, the Is best. that a real person's oh, name? Yeah. 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 Well, the best teachers you could imagine. So you brought up um you brought up my Was favorite art, teacher. Art teacher maybe? Well, I'll talk about Mrs. Burns in a moment. Mrs. Burns but you, was you brought art. up yeah, my Underbach. favorite teacher in my entire <laughs> academic career, all the way through postgraduate work was a lady named Opal Underbaki. She was a it widow. like a setup to a joke. She was an elderly I'm woman. Waiting no, for it. her name was Underbaki, Opal <laughs> yeah. Underbaki. She yeah. was a, a widow woman. Her husband had died of a split infinitive. And uh, <laughs> the <laughs> grammar, a joke. grammar joke. There. Grammar like joke, that. okay. Uh, moving on from that. No, it, she was she was <laughs> a widow. You didn't see that coming, Andrew. Oh, that's yeah. terrible. And that there, were, terrible. there were two <laughs> English teachers, a very large Christian school. There were two English teachers. And... Um, you could either get assigned to Mr. Widger or you could get assigned to Opal Underbaki. Mm -hmm. And we all wanted Mr. Widger because he was fresh out of Pillsbury Baptist Bible College okay. and we could manipulate him and figured he'd be easy. And I looked at my assignment and I was assigned to Opal Underbaki. And I was so fearful from what I'd heard of the other students of her that I went, thinking I had an in with the superintendent, I went to Dan Buchney, the superintendent, and I said to Mr. Buchney, I said, there must be some mistake. I said, I've been mistakenly assigned to Mrs. Underbaki. I said, I'm sure you meant to assign me to, to uh, Doug Widger. And um, he said, no mistake at all. He said, you want to be a preacher? He said, Mrs. Underbaki is the only English teacher you will have in your career at this school. Mm. He said, she is the best. Well with fear and trembling, sat down in the classroom. Mrs. Underbaki announced to the class that we were all barbaric savages <laughs> and that she would teach English as a foreign language. Okay. And she, she persisted in the most zealous, mind-bending English training of grammar and composition that could possibly be imaginable. I, she was amazing. But you were um, up for the challenge. You lapped it up. Man. Well, I, I did once I realized what she was doing. She yeah. she would assign these theme papers, two-page theme papers. Well, once a week. Okay, well, that's that's doable, except for one problem. You wrote your theme paper, handed it to her. She handed it back to you after a day, all marked up. And then you had to meet with her in the morning to review your theme paper and rewrite it. Yeah. The rewriting process may take two, three, or four revisions. In the meantime, you're being assigned another one the next week. You understand how this would snowball. The meetings with Mrs. Underbaki began, <laughs> she would take appointments, uh, not during school. They began at five o'clock in the morning at the school and she would have her cup of coffee and she was ready to go. Under Bucky sounds uh, like a beast. I, I, yeah. I, well, I bless the ground she walks on. When I went to Bob Jones University, I took <laughs> freshman English and, and part of this. Easy for you. Well, second semester was a, was a, a five page paper, a research paper. They taught the methods of research and that. And there came a time when I had to hand in my paper, the rough draft. It was only the rough draft very early in the semester. And, uh, the next time we had class, I came back to class and the teacher said, Mr. Monty, stand up. I stood up. He said, you have handed in the best paper, research paper that has ever been handed to me. He said, this is a rough draft. He said, it is not for you. He said, this paper, I see no improvement. And he said, you're done with the class. He yeah. said, you get an A plus. Really? Done. 
And yeah. that was the end of that. Now here's the thing. Wow. Here's the thing, Pastor Monty. Uh, so my best subject is English and writing. I've written a few things. I'm nowhere near as good at it as you, but... You're you, very you, accomplished with it. Well, thank you. You very. taught me all the all the subjects in school and the one you the one you were the best at ended up becoming the one that your students were the best at because you leaned into that english grammar and composition yeah yeah. and and so i'm very thankful for that however thankful for underbaki i am yeah Yeah. i've never met her indirect but i've heard a lot of stories (laughs) about her so I, i benefited indirectly from her uh but you have nothing published and people, publishers have come to you and said, Pastor Monty, write on this or that. So hmm. you've got this amazing gift and all this knowledge. When are you going to write a book? He's cornered you now. Uh, as soon as I get the right AI program to help me. No, no. <laughs> right. I'm, I'm, and I'm you're joking. a good typer too. I'm it all joking. comes so naturally I'm, to I'm you. joking about that. Uh, it's it's really a matter of, of, of yeah. timing, I think. And it's a matter of, of workload. And a discipline. Yeah, it's yeah. just a matter of discipline. Lord willing, at some point, I People will. would love it. Yeah. I you will. Write on what you're passionate about. I'm sure it'll be well written. And a little tribute, a dedication page in the beginning to Mrs. Underbaki. There should be. Yeah. There should be. Uh, we mentioned... My, my other teacher, my art teacher, I don't want to leave oh, her with art Burns, without yes. mention. I took art throughout high school, fine art, not modern art. Modern art is symbolic of the descent of mankind beneath the line of despair, as Francis Schaeffer spoke right. about in his excellent volume, right, right. The God Who Is There. Yes. And uh, Mrs. Burns taught art. Well, I, I I, was not good at art. I'm not artistic at all. But the one thing oh, Mrs. I Burns disagree. did... I disagree. Well, I have seen your art in Dorothy Monty's house before she passed. It was displayed. Okay, his mom's house. Of course house. it was. My yes. mom. <laughs> it really was terrific, though. Uh, I mean, it's actual Do painting. we have a picture of this, preacher? No, we need to... Do you have any of it at your house does kelly oh, yeah we, we've other? saved it we've have you ever seen it, any but... of his paintings no i need to see this he really is good at it. and the listeners at home really want to see these yeah I don't if have we can get a picture we'll get chris to post it here <laughs> this is up for that but... But anyway, yeah, uh, talk about Mrs. Burns. Uh, but Mrs. Burns knew that I would not be a career artist, but she <laughs> knew that God had called me to preach. Mm-hmm. And so she had devotions before every class and often would call upon me to lead in devotions. And um, um, my interpretation wasn't as accurate then as it is now, but uh, she would tolerate all of that. And then when, if I finished a little art project or something, uh, sometimes she would come to my desk and she'd say, uh, Mr. Monty, why don't you just take the rest of the time and go downstairs to where Dr. Richard B. Clearwaters, who was the pastor emeritus of the church then, said, go talk to Dr. Clearwaters for the remainder of this period. Many, many times she would send me to his office, and he had retired as pastor Fourth Baptist, but maintained an office there. He was our pastor for 42 years. He founded Central Baptist Seminary, Pillsbury Baptist Bible College, a tremendous pastor, tremendous man. And I would go in his office, sometimes actually wake him up, gently wake him up, because he would be asleep in his office. And then for the remainder of the hour, he would just talk to me about the ministry, and he would talk to me about just anything that, that came to mind. She sent me down there all the time, just to talk to Richard V. Clearwaters. Mm, well, wow. at the time I didn't understand. I didn't understand the gift she was giving me. I look back now and and sh- that woman gave me a gift. I, you know, art, whatever. Uh, she gave me a gift and she invested in me. You know, here's an interesting fact. She was a Christian school teacher. And when I went to Bob Jones, you know, my, my mom was on a very tight um, a budget and mm-hmm. we were, we didn't have a lot of money, obviously. And during my tenure at Bob Jones, every month, and this is back in the 1980s, every month for four years, Mrs. Burns sent me $200 a month for four years. That's love. Wow. Mm -hmm. I'll never forget it. Can you talk a little bit more about Dr. Clearwaters? And what I'd like you to talk about is people that have written books on Baptist history, when they mention Minneapolis, they mention W.B. Riley, Mm -hmm. and they mention R.V. Clearwaters. Um, a huge impact, of course, not just Fourth Baptist, but Central Seminary and Pillsbury Baptist Baptist College, uh, which, of course, now you know is no is defunct. But you got to spend a lot of time with him, and you told me. I mean, so so people are going to write Baptist history; they're going to mention R.V. Clearwaters. He's a big deal. However, he was also like a real common man. You, you've talked to me before about just how blunt he would be, how down to earth he would be. Can you he talk was. about that a little so, bit? So so he how was that brilliant. impacted you. 
He was brilliant. He was saved in a Methodist revival. His mother had prayed for him for years. He was a classic prodigal child. He had gone to, he, they grew up in the Pacific Northwest. He had gone to British Columbia and had his hand injured in a logging accident, uh, was in a hospital. And a nurse recognized his last name and knew his mother, and they communicated. And eventually, uh, Richard came back to his, his home of origin uh, there on the farm in Washington State. Uh, there was a point in time when he was helping his, his uh, family with chores, and they were uh, he was riding a buckboard drawn by horses, and it had a load of gravel in the back. And he his little brother was sitting next to him on the buckboard. The horses did something, and he stood to... Uh, calm the horses and to get them calmed down. When he did that, the seat that they were sitting on, it flipped and his brother uh, fell off and under the wheels of this wagon that had been drawn with, uh, with um, uh, gravel and died. He eventually died. And that was the thing that stirred Dr. Clearwater's heart. He felt a great sense of guilt over that. There was an accident, but he felt a great sense of guilt. And he said that um, at night, the only comfort he could find would be to lift the window in his bedroom and listen to the crickets chirping on the farm fields in, there in Washington State. And they had a Methodist revival. It was scheduled to last two weeks, but weather had come in and they were thinking of canceling. And uh, the preacher said, no, we'll, we'll stay the second week. And so in the second week, Mrs. Clearwaters prevailed upon her son to uh, go to that revival. And he'd heard the word of God from her. She was a very strong Bible-believing Christian. And uh, when he left home as a prodigal son, her parting words to him were these, the way of the transgressor is hard. Mm -hmm. And when he came back and the accident happened and he was searching, he did go to that revival in that little wooden Methodist church out in, out in Washington State. And in that, I believe, was the second week of that revival uh, he trusted the Lord as his Savior and then Amen. later was called to preach. Um, his education went only through the eighth grade. Mm. Um, he went, uh, hopped on a train and went to Moody Bible Institute in Chicago. When he got there to register for, for class, they asked about his high school transcript. He said, I have none. I only went through the eighth grade. They said, we can't matriculate you because you've only gone through the eighth grade. And uh, someone overhearing the conversation said, well, there's a, a tutor. Uh, professor at Northwestern University that will tutor you. And so he took tutoring, high school tutoring from a Northwestern University professor, went to Moody Bible Institute. His, his, grad, his uh, high school diploma was really a, a degree from Northwestern. Very interesting. And then he went to Moody Bible Institute. He went to Kalamazoo College in Michigan, a classical college. Uh, he graduated from Northern, I think it was Northern Seminary in Chicago, Northern Baptist Seminary. Uh, and brilliant. The single smartest man I've ever known in my life. He could read or speak in five different languages, yeah. uh, biblical languages, German, Latin. Uh, he, was a, he was a brilliant mind, um, but very, very relatable. Yeah. And uh, as a young preacher, I think... You, you have followed that mold. People know you as a brilliant mind, but uh, very relatable. The, the, the yeah. brilliant mind part, nothing like a clear water. You so were let me still tell you when you finished your yeah, undergraduate yeah. training. I mean, so, you know, that's a, that's a big deal, Monty. Okay, it's not that big a deal. Yeah. Okay, but let's just move on from that. And so, yeah. so, but you followed so, in that mold, and I think that's well, great that he modeled that for you. But he was brilliant beyond brilliant. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, But as a young man, after he got called to preach, he was given an opportunity to preach... A message and he got up he preached the message had his notes everything was ready and in his mind the message was a total failure mm. and when he got back to his room he got on his knees and he was crying out to God and, and he was so embarrassed he said it was a total failure and he he got in his mind that the reason the sermon failed was he had notes he'd brought notes to the pulpit mm. and so on his knees he promised God that he would be a preacher, but he would never carry notes into the pulpit. Mm -hmm. He would only have his Bible. Mm -hmm. He kept that promise throughout his entire ministry. Mm -hmm. He never carried notes. Now that meant that there was no one more mentally prepared to preach than was Clearwaters because he analyzed and memorized and, and was brilliant and built what at that time was the largest independent Baptist church in the state of Minnesota and the most soul winning, by far the most evangelistic and soul winning church in the state. Yeah, really interesting.
I want to ask you about your wife. I mentioned earlier how she made a big sacrifice to have me in her home and, and the other foster sons, you know, while you're raising your biological sons. I thought it was amazing for me growing up in a how not to do family, watching Johnny and, and that whole mess, my stepdad. Uh, and then I got to see how do how to do family, how you and Kelly were trying to be Christ-like and raise your kids as unto the Lord. Um, but again, she made a lot of sacrifices for me. But, but then, you know, Britton and I got married and we got into ministry and Britton has been inspired by Kelly, watching her as the pastor's wife at Faith. Um, will you talk to us a little bit about what your wife has meant to you just as a wife, but then also as a co-laborer in ministry? And does she have all the dishes done? <laughs> she always has the dishes done. Praise the Lord. I was, a while back, our dishwasher broke, and oh. I was trying to fix it. And you know Did how she things... break her arm or oh, like... No, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Our dishwasher oh, no. broke, and, and I was I was getting... I'm was, trying to fix sharp, it, but Andrew. I didn't know that, that, was, that sharp. was very sharp. But, wow. Did she break her but, arm but or her he, leg? He's like, uh, <laughs> I, tried to, I tried to fix it, and it was taking too long a time. And, and uh, Kelly had told some people in the church that the dishwasher broke, and someone came up and said, well, Pastor, um, did did you ever fix your dishwasher? So I don't need to fix my dishwasher. Well, do you have a dishwasher? They said, well, I said, I married a dishwasher. But anyway, yeah, right, right, anyway, yeah, right. no, um, in, in all seriousness, there is not one level of ministry in my life that could ever have been accomplished without Kelly at my side. Now, you know, James, she is not a woman to want to take over the church. And, and she likes uh, to do the behind the scenes. Uh, she stuff. is a behind the scenes yes. person. But um, she cooks the, meals at the church sometimes for how many? Yes, 500 people. Yes, she's, feeding she's, at once. A, she's our food person. It's she remarkable. loves to feed, yeah. make sure and people and her team, quality. all those things. And she yeah. is a great cook and she's all that. But the, the, the greatest thing is this that she never ever held me back in regard to my ministry calling. And she always followed what I felt was the will of God. Even when, even when she might have had uh, reservations or, or hesitation about it, she was always willing to do, if I knew, if I could tell her, I know that God's in this, mm -hmm. she, she would allow for that. And then she understood that our ministry was not nine to five. It was our home. Mm -hmm. It was everything that we had to offer um, to people and to the Lord's work. And so she was always willing. It, it was not easy. Don't ever get the idea that, that this was easy. It was very difficult. And you've mentioned the word sacrifice several times. And she made tremendous sacrifices for this to happen. But um, I always tell people this, a Faith Baptist Church, I have tremendous job security, tremendous at Faith Baptist, because they like me, but they love her. Yeah. Yeah, they won't fire me because they love her too yeah. much. So it's very similar to our ministry here. Right. Yeah. <laughs> People love Britain. Money, I want to ask you a question real quick. Um, you've been in ministry a long time, obviously. Now, what would you say, uh, as far as the church goes, is the biggest issue that you've seen, uh, like in the church right now? What would you say are some of the biggest issues? The church at large. Yeah. The church yeah, at large. Well, it depends yeah. on the church. But so let's focus on the Independent Baptist Church. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you know, I see a huge issue being divisiveness among churches with one another, which mm -hmm. ought not to be, but then also divisiveness within the church and an unwillingness. Okay, so to, to sum it up in our movement, there is a problem where people are in love with the method more than the mission. Mm -hmm. They're, they've adopted a particular methodology, and then if you ever diverge yeah. from that, they view that as some kind of compromise, even if the methodology has become less effective than it used to be. Or if you introduce something new um, to the congregation, or yeah, some, in some churches even changing the time of the service, so these things, they're all preferential matters, or they're matters of methodology, but they come, become a big deal. And the problem is that by defending every method or preference, we have become irrelevant. This is not the 1980s. Okay? Yeah, you'd say and when you say we, you're talking about the independent fundamental Baptist movement. The independent Baptist, Baptist movement, movement is yeah, irrelevant. The so so, so <clears throat> the, in the fundamentalist movement of the 70s and particularly the 80s was so strong and so politically influential, you don't remember this, that every the Republican, and, every and Republican Falwell, candidate Jones. for president yeah. went to Bob Jones right. and spoke there to get the imprimatur of Bob Jones. Yeah. That is how influential the fundamentalist vote was. Yeah. 
and uh, the the at the time uh, public broadcasting did a special um, I can't remember the name of it now it was a documentary that they did about fundamentalism and and really they came at it from the aspect that these people are going to take over America. It was a whole documentary about the influence of fundamentalism in America. You can't remember this because there was such an influence. Now um, our influence has been very muted, and I think there are a number of reasons for that. But we were at one time, we were the most innovative people. Fundamentalists were, okay? The first um, uh, coast-to-coast radio broadcast was Charles E. Fuller. I mean, of any kind of broadcast mm -hmm. was Charles E. Fuller, the old-fashioned revival hour. When when radio came out, um, we were very quick to adopt radio as a means to reach into people's homes and their cars and into their lives. When television came out, the great ministries were fundamentalist preachers using this brand new medium and <clears throat> taking a, a brand new method and embracing it for the sake of evangelism. And then somewhere along the line, I, I feel like a lot of that has, has stopped. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate Northstone because you're using this podcast medium, the, the, all of the things that are available, the social media, you're using all of that for the sake and cause of Christ and the gospel. Amen. And, yeah. and we need to be forward with it. So I, I think uh, the infighting mm -hmm. caused us problems. I think loving the method more than the uh, message and the mission has caused us problems. Mm -hmm. uh, I think focusing on, on wrong things, becoming an us for no more movement. So very famous older pastor, he's with the Lord now, but I was asking him about this one time, and I said, "What what is the difference?" And he said, "He said in the seventies and eighties, the Independent Baptist Church was often the largest church in any town in America." And he said, "The reason was soul winning and evangelism." He said we really had a burden for souls. He said then somewhere along the line that changed to we're not the most evangelistic church, but we are the most right church. Mm -hmm. We are the most correct church. And then he, in essence, and I'm paraphrasing what he said, we, we sharpened our pencil point of right and correct and started attacking one another. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, his music's not my music, so they're wrong and I'm right. Come to our church, we're right with God. They're not right with God. And then all of that infighting and hyper-separatism took place, and, and, and now the movement has become increasingly mm -hmm. pusillanimous. Mm -hmm. Yeah, weak. Yeah, good word. Yeah. Word of the day. <clears throat> Pastor Monty, let me, you mentioned infighting. I want to transition the conversation a little bit. Because uh, when you think of, when I think of friendly fire among Christians and infighting, I think of John 17, where Jesus is praying his high priestly prayer. And he prayed many things. Among them was that the disciples love one for another would represent, would, would reflect uh, the father's love for the son. Mm -hmm. That is a prayer that, as best as I can tell, the it wasn't answered in the affirmative. I mean, there has been infighting in, in right. Christian circles mm -hmm. since since Christ. Uh, <clears throat> and so I'm taking what you just said here about fundamentalism, and I'm transitioning into kind of a theological question. And that is, one would think that Jesus's uh, petitions to the Father would have been answered in the affirmative, but I can think of several that were not. Uh, you, like, let this cup pass from me, you know, the cup of God's wrath. And so basically the answer is, but he says, nevertheless, not right. my will, but thine be done. Um, and he goes to the cross. Like, and then we're comforted to think, uh, to, to know that Jesus has ascended and now he is uh, ever living and he's seated at the right hand of God the Father specifically to make intercession for us. You know, there are times though where even the son gets a no. Talk to us about that just a little bit. I, have you well, ever thought through that? Uh, Theologically, uh, Jesus did not get a no. The prayer for Christian unity will be answered in its fulfillment. But so we got to wait. When we see he Christ, gotta wait. we've got to wait. Yeah, yeah we've he gotta he got to wait because the way the Lord answers our prayer sometimes is yes, no, or wait. Right. Yeah. Uh, what about one now, day we'll all we'll all get straightened out and we'll all be happy and we'll agree. Yeah. Yeah. Now, sometimes, by the way, for the viewer watching this. Um, uh, we give the uh, the guests the questions ahead of time. So some of these questions, we Pastor Monty has no idea. So I have no idea how you're going to answer this, and you have no idea this question. <laughs> oh, is this coming. a brand new question? Brand new thought here for you. So when Jesus says, so we're talking about how I believe sometimes he gets a no from the Father. He had to go bear the cup of God's wrath. He said, let this cup pass from me, and it didn't. Okay. Nevertheless, not thy will, but thine be done. What about when he said, 
Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Hmm. I suggest he also got a no on that one. What I mean is the father didn't forgive them for crucifying him as if to usher them into heaven. They're, they're now forgiven. They get to go to heaven. I think the point of father forgive them for they know not what they do was to show, to model, love your enemies. Yes, and to model forgiveness. To model forgiveness, but but I don't think that prayer request was answered in the affirmative. Do you? Oh, and as in all those people just went to heaven? They all were forgiven. No, no Were they no, all forgiven? I, I would guess not. I think okay. he's saying, Father, forgive them. Right, I would guess not. What do you think? But I, I think really it was a question. demonstration. It's a very good question. It was a demonstration of the, remember, that's God on the cross. Mm -hmm. It's a demonstration of the heart of God to forgive. Now, how, how do we come to God? We've come through the blood of Jesus and personal faith and repentance, belief in him, okay? Yeah. But it was the heart of God to forgive. God, God's grace is so great that it extends to those who were in the act of crucifying him. And what, what do you think about so this? It so it models that beautifully. Well, yes, most yeah. people, most yeah. people, um, they will hold a grudge against someone for something they've done. And then somewhere down the line, they'll, uh, they, they'll kind of get over it. And so then they'll say, okay, well, I've, I've forgiven him. You didn't really forgive. You just got over it. Forgiveness happens when the sting of the offense is still in my heart. Mm -hmm. That's when forgiveness happens. And forgiveness happens... It's, the sting of the offense is still in, in your heart, in but you heart. still forgive. But you forgive. And Jesus, yeah. the sting of the offense was on his brow, it was on his back, it was in his feet, it was in his hands, mm -hmm. and he demonstrated the grace of forgiveness, saying, Father, forgive them. And, and even said this, for they know not what they do. Well, they didn't know they were crucifying the Son of God. They did not understand that. But when he uses that terminology, it's, it's almost as if, Father, forgive them, because this is all just done out of ignorance. And it's yeah. almost, almost like he's making a little bit of an excuse for the errant transgressions of humans because his grace is that great. I just want you to think about that. And then if you think about that, yeah. you do not have the right to not forgive anyone right, yeah. their trespasses. So make those wouldn't, that's good. Thinking yeah. through these things, wouldn't all of Jesus's prayers uh, while he was on the earth be just somewhat of a model, right? Because in his humanity, obviously he's praying and modeling it uh, for us, but in his divinity, he's basically praying to himself. I know there's, you know, other layers of the Godhead. And so he's praying to the Father, but but he is, you know, 100% God at the same time he's human. So he knows what's going to happen from his prayer, mm -hmm. right? And so isn't is, wouldn't all of Jesus's prayers be somewhat of a model of his humanity? Well, certainly every That's all the prayers point. of Christ are a model for us. There's no doubt about that. Yeah. That's a good point. Interesting. All right. I have, a, I have a question, Pastor Monty, that I've been wondering a little bit. Um, and so what are your thoughts on this? So uh, from what I've seen, uh, a lot of the well-known pastors or preachers out there uh, tend to be Calvinistic. OK. And so a lot of the well-known guys like Spurgeon or John MacArthur or, you know, other well-known guys like that, they tend to lean Calvinistic. And there's not a lot of people that are well-known out there advocating for, you know, some of the beliefs that, that me and you hold. And so why do you think that is the, the way? Is that true the way it is? Or, or why is specifically well, soteriological beliefs? Correct. Right. Yeah. yeah. Right. OK. Not reformed theology overall, but but salvation. Well, first of all, you well, know, isn't that the distinguishing characteristic when you talk Calvinism? People think soteriology, right? Right. That's a crowning characteristic. Yeah. That's a major doctrine. But there, there are <laughs> other mean, things. You could the... be a Calvinistic dispensationalist. Well, and John and MacArthur reformed. is, by the okay, way. Then John he's MacArthur he's would a dispensationalist because his daddy was. But really, the question is, you know, why are all these rather famous or popular yeah. men, they'll tend to lead... Um, like John Calvinistic. Piper as well. well. Yeah. I can give you, though, a list of very famous um, preachers that were not at all Calvinistic, that would never even consider Calvinism. Matthew, Mark, Luke, <laughs> John, <laughs> okay, Peter, Paul, Amen. Paul, certainly not Paul. He was no Calvinist. Right. Okay, so I've always, those are very famous preachers. They were not Calvinistic. Okay, just to <laughs> to be clear, yeah. to be crystal clear yeah, that's on good, that. Bonnie, that's um, a good answer. I I think that I think that uh, I've lived long enough yeah. to watch 
an interesting ebb and flow, uh, pendulum swing, if you will. Uh, when I was a, a student at Bob Jones, Calvinism was very much, this would be the 1980s, 85 to 89, Calvinism was very much on the decline generally and certainly within our, our circle of fundamentalism. For example, you uh, they had a list of churches you were allowed to go to and churches you couldn't, and unless you came there as a Presbyterian student, we had some, If you, unless you came there as a Presbyterian, you couldn't go to a Presbyterian church. Mm -hmm. uh, Calvinistic churches were off limits. As a preacher boy, uh, I was handed a pamphlet, as were all of us, a pamphlet uh, by Dr. Curtis Hudson, why I disagree with all five points of Calvinism. So at that time, uh, Bob Jones took a pretty strong uh, anti, I would say anti-Calvinistic stance. So then over time though, we've watched the pendulum swing back and a lot of men are are tending more toward reformed. I think that part of that is a, a cultural reaction to some of the um, excesses of those who would claim to be non-Calvinistic, okay? And, and maybe, uh, I don't want to use the word abuses because that word is abused, but the excesses that took place sometimes in, in certain types of evangelism where it was very mechanical, pray this prayer, you're going to heaven, those kind of things. And, and frankly, that so many of the people who took the non-Calvinist position were lacking in an intellectual presentation of anything. Mm -hmm. And um, the one thing the Calvinistic side has had is a lot of very scholarly individuals. Now, that does not justify that doctrine, but it does say that the popularity may be because people wanted um, to listen to a Bible message that was more cerebral, and that is our problem, okay, mm -hmm. where the shallow preaching, where you just get up and scream about stuff and don't teach people the Word of God, um, genuine Christians get worn out by that, mm -hmm. and they look for something that's going to teach the Word of God. And so some of those men have. Now, uh, having said that, uh, Spurgeon was a Calvinist, okay, but he was a soul winner. Mm -hmm. D. James Kennedy, one of my, my heroes of the last hundred yeah. years, Dr. D. James Kennedy was a Presbyterian, Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the soul winner, great soul winner. These were wonderful evangelistic men, and uh, they did hold a different theology from me, but uh, I would not discount them in the work of God. Yeah, D. James Kennedy <clears throat> had a robed choir, and he rumor did. has it that now Faith has a robed he choir. He did, he did. Faith Baptist Church, we have uh, introduced, ro because we're very fundamental. And yes. <laughs> you don't have a robed choir. No, well, I hope Pastor not, Jason does not get any you're, ideas you're not, from no, this no, no, podcast. No. You're not fundamental, that's why. You're, oh, you're, yeah. The new standard now, <laughs> if you're going to be fundamental, you have to have robes on your choir. Yeah. That's my new standard. Yeah. I'm, of course, I'm being facetious. So <laughs> we, we did that for a number of reasons, but I like the... Um, atmosphere of worship that a uh, robed choir brings. I like the uniformity that it brings. I frankly like the fact that the clothing that people wear uh, can be at times distractive, not only in the sense of right. maybe lacking modesty, but in the sense of being garish. Sure. Uh, we we have platform standards, and we in the past asked that our men would wear sport coats or suit coats, and the ladies would dress in modest skirts and dresses. Okay, well, people either don't know, or some people, frankly, challenge that. We didn't have that really at our church, but, but uh, that would be the case in other places. But men today don't generally own sport coats, suit coats. So people didn't want to go out and buy, they want to sing the choir, but they don't want to buy a sport coat. So then they went to Goodwill and found a sport coat, and then they, they looked like homeless people standing up in the choir. Not not to criticize that, but you know what I'm saying. It just looked tacky. And, yeah. the, and then some people can't match. And, and there's all these things. And so, um, but modesty was an issue. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I thought, well, it's hard to enforce, by the way. Mm -hmm. It's hard to enforce. It's yeah. hard for the pastor to walk up to some lady on a Sunday morning and say, you know, your dress is inappropriate. You won't be singing in choir today. Okay. Mm -hmm. There's no better way to ruin everything than yeah. that. So yeah. we we decided we'd go with the robes. And I explained all this to the church. I love it. Um, yeah. And our choir has grown, significantly oh. grown. We have not lost people. The choir has grown with uh, with the addition of the choir robes. And I, I just told the church, I, I went through the whole thing with them. And I said, uh, I said to sum this all up, folks, I said, when it comes to the choir, we've got you 
covered. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, That's a great it's pastor been, money. It's, yeah, been, it's good. It's man. been, it's, good. it's been, uh, it's been very good. People yeah. have taken it very well. And, and uh, I think that it does present a, we're traditional in our worship, no criticism, other people, but we're more traditional. Mm -hmm. And, and, uh, I think it does present a very traditional, yeah. um, worship, um, um, um place. Now uh, there are other churches, Preston Wood Baptist, they were, were robes and, and different churches. So we're not odd. Richard Wallace, I'm told his church in Texas. Say, okay. And I, so that's not an odd thing. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's just yeah. something we did. And we're very happy with it. Yeah, that's fun. I'm glad you guys are doing it. It's a that. preference. Sure, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> so this podcast is called Strength for Life. Mm -hmm. There have been a couple times in your life where you went through very deep valleys. We talked about the loss of your dad when you were a boy. I'm sure that was your first major deep valley, losing your dad to cancer. Um, but another one maybe deeper was losing your identical twin brother. Mm -hmm. um, I think I'm right to say the two of you were eight minutes apart mm -hmm. um, and identical to the mm -hmm. point that you sounded the same, you looked the same when you did your hair, you guys went through phases where you're mm -hmm. doing your hair the same. Um, and and Mike, uh, I met him before I met you a couple years, you know, before you, you were in Concord, North Carolina pastoring. He was pastoring in Minneapolis. You both fresh out of Bob Jones went to pastor you a little before him. Anyhow, Mike knocked on my door with Doc Hedges, a veterinarian in the church. They had a storefront ministry, and, uh, and Mike uh, invited me to Vacation Bible School. And I was at Calvary for probably two years before you came as my youth pastor. And I was giving Mike all the trouble, and I eventually <laughs> started giving you. But uh, he had a huge formative influence on my life, um, and then you so much the more even. But... Um, could you talk to us, talk to the, the listener, give them some strength for their life. When your identical twin brother committed suicide, that was a deep, deep valley for you. Um, talk to us about how the Lord led you through that pain. Well, that was, I, without a doubt, that was the darkest, darkest time of my life. And in, in my dad's death, he had had cancer for years. We'd watch him, we watched him really diminish and after he did pass away, there was, it's, people would understand, I'm sure in the audience, there was almost a sense of relief that he was no longer suffering, at least in this world, and that he was, you know, that, that, that this chapter was over. But um, my brother's taking his own life came really very much out of the uh, clear blue. Um, after I moved here, uh, he and I, you know, we were identical, but we weren't close all the time. We mm -hmm. weren't, we weren't uh, super close, but I would call him and, you know, usually once or twice a month and we'd have some, some talk back and forth. And there came a time when that wasn't as regular. Um, and I had inquired about some things with people up there and was assured that everything was okay. And, and, uh, then it wasn't, it was really only uh, maybe a few weeks prior to this happening that I really understood that things had come off the rails um, in many ways in his life. And um, I remember our last conversation because we were, this was several months before, uh, maybe two months before, but maybe more, I don't remember when, but I remember our last conversation, you know, I was uh, trying to talk to him about some things that I was doing to, um, you know, make sure my mood was right and, and work on things like that. And, and I remember he, he apparently arrived at where he was going. We were just talking on the phone. And uh, he said, well, I, 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 I've got to go now, Mark. I'll talk to you later. You know, and that was kind of the end of the conversation. I didn't know that would be the last time I would ever uh, speak to him. So mm -hmm. when that happened, um, it, it came as a real bolt out of the blue, even though I was aware that there were uh, some problems in his life and some problems uh, there. And um, it really fell on us because Kelly and I had just been – We'd flown from Chicago to, we'd driven up to Chicago to get tickets, a plane flight down to San Antonio to see our son Thomas graduate from boot camp with the United States Air Force. And when we got back to Chicago, things had really gone off the rails. And I remember that um, uh, we were in Chicago and I told Kelly, I said, we need to drive straight to my mother's house. And so we went there, drove there through the night. We were in Wisconsin somewhere and... Um, Someone actually from Pensacola Christian College called us and asked me to pull off of the road and then talk to me. They had heard what had happened. I didn't know at this point. Yeah. I had no knowledge of it at this point and, and said that he had taken his life. And that really began a um, very difficult time. And, and if someone has not gone through this, mm -hmm. they cannot speak to this. Uh, the, the 
um, depth of this and the pain and, and frankly the guilt that you feel you feel immediately um, there should have been something I, I could have done to prevent this or I should have seen this coming or there are just a multiple uh, kind of self-accusation things that you go through but um, I knew at that point I had to go up and take care of my mom mm -hmm. and get her back to Indiana immediately mm -hmm. and so we drove through the night we got to mom's house that morning, um, I had to explain to her what had happened. She was quite elderly. Uh, she still had clarity. She was not Before in dementia, dementia at that yeah. time, but yeah. not at that time. But mm -hmm. um, and then I told her that uh, um, I had to take care of her, and she was going to move. And and on the way leaving the house that night, um, we'd packed up some stuff, and we were going to leave and head head back to Indiana and right when she was walking from the doorway of the house into the attached garage, um, she got real stubborn and she put her hand on the, the door post and uh, she said, I am not going anywhere. She said, this is my home and this is where I live and she I refuse to go. many decades. I mean, uh, right? Many, Lake, many years Forest since Lake high Lake school Minnesota. yeah, in yeah. Forest Lake, Minnesota yeah. and yeah. since I was in, well, college, my freshman year in college is when she moved there. And and she said, I will not go anywhere. And um, I said, Mom, I said, you are going. You have no choice. And I picked her up physically mm. and carried her and put her in the front seat of that vehicle. And my wife, this was February. It was very cold. It was very dark. We backed out of the garage and uh, just got on the road. And Mom didn't say anything. And um, it was a very quiet ride. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so we, we got her back. Um, and she lived in our home for a number of years until the dementia got to the point where, where she couldn't. But um, I say all that to say that the, the, his suicide took place. And then immediately after that, there was no time mm -hmm. to do anything except to deal with mom and make sure that mom was okay. And um, that became... James very crushing and I I didn't at the time at the time I thought well I all I need to do is get my life back to normal everything is going to be back to normal I never took the time to uh, properly process that mm -hmm. um, I was never encouraged to and I don't blame anyone for that at all I my youth pastor growing up came to see me pastor Craig Culbreth uh, he came to see me at one point and he asked me, he said, how, how, how much of, he's a Southern Baptist pastor. He said, how much of a furlough or a, what do they call that? Um, not furlough, um, oh, a sabbatical, a sabbatical did you, church. did you take yeah. after that? And I said, oh, I said, we're independent Baptists. We don't, we don't know what the word yeah, sabbatical the Southern Baptist that, thing, yeah, right, yeah. means, but, um, and I didn't want one. Yeah. All I wanted to do was get preaching and preach and, and work and everything. But you but, needed one. But I needed one, yeah. but I didn't know that. Yeah. I did not know that at the time. And then. Uh, a lot of pastors would come to me and they would uh, say stuff like, well, have you adequately grieved? And and then have you gone through the five steps of grieving? And I was familiar with the concept, but didn't even know what that meant. And uh, one pastor in particular said, well, Brother Monty, if you don't go through the five steps of grieving, you're just going to blow up. You're going to crack up. You're going to you're going to fall apart. And um, that bothered me more than I mean that got on my brain, mm -hmm. you know. And I was just sorting this all through and and through a series of events that were divinely uh, orchestrated. Um, the Lord led me to a counselor. Uh, I only did like three or four sessions with a professional counselor, psychological counselor, um, and, uh, and used the Bible, man who used the Bible. And then uh, I developed from scripture a methodology of thinking that changed everything. Mm -hmm. It it helped to remove the anxiety. Now there was still, you've got to understand, there was months of 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 struggle here. This wasn't an instantaneous healing. Mm -hmm. Uh but my peace of mind series that I preached a lot of different places that came as a result of this. And yeah. so uh, you know you it, there's nothing you don't go back to normal. Mm -hmm. In life you sometimes go back to a new normal. But every time you go through an awful tragedy God is trying to teach you something. Mm -hmm. And that's where your faith comes in. You don't cash God in because of that. Mm -hmm. You say, okay, God, show yourself mighty. Get me through this. What can I learn? And, and honestly, how can I help someone else? Yeah. To tie it back into what we were talking about earlier, um, you know, I want to commend to the people your Peace of Mind series, uh, but you need to write. 
I you know. should write the peace of mind. It's the I've best way for them. So to, many times. Yeah, the best way for you to get the peace of mind series from Pastor Marty, I think, is Sermon Audio. Sermon where, Audio, uh, Faith yeah. Baptist Church, faithbaptistchurch dot com. Yeah. Then look around on the website. I think there's a drop down bar it's four, for five, resources. Four or five sermons in the and, peace uh, of mind a, series. And there's on that website. There's more than that. I've added yeah. to it uh, more sermons that are. Helpful. And it's would you say it's primarily based on? I think it's Proverbs twenty three seven. As a man thinketh in his, in his heart, heart. So, so is he. Think. That's the basis. But yeah. then the the major scripture portions are Matthew 6 and Philippians. Yeah, and, and you give very practical instruction on, on how to uh, flex your mental muscle mm -hmm. and control what you're thinking about That's in the right. midst of real grief. That's right, and yeah. you have to do that. You cannot you cannot let your mind just run, run, run wild. Mm -hmm. um, and people say, well, I can't help what I think. Paul says you can. Mm -hmm. He says, think on these things and over and over things. again. We're instructed how to think, what to think about. We just have to obey. Yeah, and I've, it's it's a model. It it gives you a a, a format of which to discipline yourself. Yeah, Pastor Money, thank you so much for joining us. Well, today thank you on the podcast. This is a lot of fun. Yeah, and you've offered us a lot of strength for life today. So. We'll have to do a part two. Talk about well, the Nephilim so. and Genesis six. Oh, yes. one of my favorite topics yeah. in the world <laughs> is is the Genesis. <laughs> By the way, just since we're plugging uh, my 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 sermons, uh, we have of uh, uh, faithbaptistchurch.com. If you go on our resources page, Sermon Audio, Faith Baptist Church, Sermon Audio page, Genesis all of my Unleashed. Sunday School lessons, yes, yes. <laughs> all of my yes. Sunday School lessons, Genesis Unleashed. I've listened to, to are, four or five are, of them. As, as okay, I good. teach them, they Very come up good. and you get a printable PDF as well Fancy. of okay. all the lessons. Free so, of charge. Free of charge. So yes. you, all of this is free of charge. And I'm and, sure it's um, well written. Whatever's on the uh, PDF, Mrs. Underbaki would be I pleased. do my best. I probably <laughs> would... We, she would probably slash it to pieces, but oh, I, I, yes, that's all available. Yeah. People are loving that. People I'm sure, yeah. are loving that. I've had yeah. people come up to me this week um, at the college and at your church and mm -hmm. say very in quiet tones, they say, Pastor Monty, I'm, I'm <laughs> listening to Genesis Unleashed and I love it. So <laughs> yeah. very good. Preacher, I love you a whole lot. I love you too. Yeah, you, you had know a that. huge influence on my life. I feel like I have a debt to you that I can never repay. And uh, you, you know, you spoke uh, vision into my life, and now I feel like I'm living my dream. The Lord gave you me are. the life I prayed for, and gave me sons, which I specifically prayed for sons, and they're godly sons. And uh, and the Lord gave me ministry, and I'm just so thankful. And you're a big part of that. So thank you, preacher. Wow. Well, yeah, God thank bless you. you both. Thank Amen. you. Amen. All right, and to you, uh, thank you for joining us uh, here on today's Strength for Life podcast. We trust that. That what you have heard strengthened your life. We understand that God is our refuge and he's our strength and he is a very present help in trouble. If there are ways that I can serve you as a pastor, I'd be happy to do that. Please email me if you would. You can email me directly at pastor at northstonebaptist.org. All right. Hey, God bless you. And thanks again for joining us on Strength for Life.